me a, a great pleasure to introduce uh, my student, Eleanor, for the second talk here. Um, so, Eleanor uh, joined the group um, almost three and a half years ago now. Um, in fact, it was so, so long ago, it was before we was really a group. We was just a, a collection of people then. Um, and I think it's fair to say you, you've come along and grown a lot in that time. Um, I think your academic skills, that was always there, but your, your confidence has really come along and, uh, and your personality comes through really well now, which is great to see. Um, so over, over these last three and a half years, Ellen has delivered a uncanny ability now to predict the advice I'm going to give her. And in fact, a lot, of, a lot of our meetings now go, she'll start telling me about something, I'll then interrupt her, go, oh, what about this? And then she skips to the next slide and shows me the result of what I was about to suggest to do. So um, I think that's... Yeah, that, that's great to see. Um, so I, I just want to give a couple of reasons why I think this is a really important bit of work. I mean, firstly, Eleanor is my first student that I've been primary supervisor for, so obviously she's going to be very important to me. Um, secondly, Eleanor's actually sponsored by Elector. Uh, now, those of you who don't know Elector, they're one of the, the two main radiotherapy manufacturers in the world. Uh, and the project she's working on, I mean, she'll tell you much more about it, uh, but it says it's working on the MR LINAC. Uh, and I think it's fair to say Elector have put a lot into the MR LINAC. And if it fails, they might not go completely bust, but it'll be a really big deal for them. So it, it's really important. Um, <coughs> and Eleanor's project is actually working on being able to treat lung cancer on the MR LINAC. And uh, lung cancer, I think it's fair to say, is one of the most deadly cancers still in the world today. So not only is it important for me, not only is it important for Elector, but it's important clinically as well. Um, so just before I hand over to her, just one more quick thing to say, and that is, we was actually, uh, last summer, we was over uh, in Montreal, uh, out there for a conference, and uh, Elector's main research offices working on the MR Linac are out in Montreal, um, and we thought it'd be great for Eleanor to visit them for a little while first, so we sent her over for a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks working beforehand, uh, then me and my, uh, my postdoc Bjorn, we went out for the last week, for the week, the second of those two weeks, uh, to have a holiday, uh, but we was ca caught up with Eleanor while I was there, I was actually staying with her, and I think it was the first evening we sat down, and then it was like, right, just spent the last two days going through with Elector, all the details of everything, and they've turned around and said, yep, you're right. Your, uh, the, the work uh, Eleanor's doing is a better approach than Elector are pursuing themselves. So that was like one of my proudest moments hearing them, them say that. Um, and yeah, and I think, and, and finally, just to say, off the back of Eleanor's uh, PhD, Elector have just recently agreed a new research agreement with UCL, so hopefully they'll be now funding more PhDs to come. And it's no exaggeration to say that Eleanor's PhD is a massive part in securing that. So, um, yeah, so without any more, I'll hand over to Eleanor. Here you go. Okay, thanks, Jamie, for your kind introduction. Uh, so hi everyone, and uh, I'll, in my presentation I'll start with a little bit of background on radiotherapy and uh, um, the treatment uh, of lung cancer patients with radiotherapy. And uh, as uh, Jamie mentioned before, uh, I'll show you why the MRNAC technology is uh, important for that. And then I'll describe my current research on respiratory motion models and their application for an MR LINAC. <laughs> And I'll finish off with the summary and the future work. So start with radiotherapy. The radiotherapy is the use of ionizing radiations to kill cancer cells. And nearly 50% of all cancer patients receive radiotherapy as part of their treatment. So we really need to give them, to offer them the best treatment possible. The um, standard radiotherapy treatment starts with a, a pretreatment CT scan where um, uh, the treatment is planned in order to maximize the dose to the tumor and minimize the dose to the healthy uh, tissues and in particular to the organs at risk. After a couple of weeks, the patient starts the treatment and the treatment is delivered over multiple uh, days or weeks. And the treatment is actually delivered over multiple sessions called fractions. And in each fraction, the uh, um, treatment is delivered accordingly to the original plan. And the problem is that the, currently, the um, anatomical changes which occur within a single fraction or between the different fractions are not taken into account. And uh, our research, as uh, Jamie mentioned, is focused on the, uh, using radiotherapy for lung cancer patients. And uh, lung cancer is the leading cause of death for cancer patients worldwide. 
And it's characterized by a poor survival, equal to 5% at 10 years after diagnosis. So we really need to improve the way we treat these patients. And we would like to do so using, by improving radiotherapy. Uh, the, one of the challenges when treating lung cancer patients with radiotherapy is given by respiratory motion. And this is because the treatment lasts usually uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, also, the, in this period, obviously, the, patient, uh, the patients breathe. And the respiratory motion is problematic because it's irregular and not reproducible. So we can have intracycle variations. And you can see this red arrow. Uh, you can imagine is as the path of the tumor during breathing. So the tumor will follow a different path during inhalation and exhalation. We've got also intercycle variations. So we can have a deeper breath and a shallow breath. And this, this would be the um, path of the tumor. But we've also got day-to-day -day variations. That means that the tumor and the other structures may uh, move in a different way from uh, one day to the other. And all these variations can cause, uh, um, in the context of radiotherapy, some problems. So the first two types of variations are called intra, are the interfraction variations, and the last one is, uh, falls under the interfraction variations. And these uh, variations, as I said, can cause errors when <coughs> planning and delivering radiotherapy. And uh, one of the ways that um, the patients are treated nowadays is using, for example, gated treatment. In this case, uh, the treatment is delivered at breath hold uh, when, for example, uh, the, uh, it, in, one of, in one specific uh, phase of the breathing cycles, in particular the end exhale, this means that the uh, the beam will be switched on only when the tumor is at the next sale. Or, and uh, this uh, is problematic if we think about the breath-to-breath uh, -breath and day-to-day -day variations because the motion of the tumor during planning may differ from the motion of the tumor uh, during um, delivery. So the end exhale position may be different, especially if we think that the um, position uh, in the respiratory cycle is actually estimated using external devices. So we are not actually, um, we, are, we, we don't have information about internal anatomy itself. Another way, um, actually, if we knew the position of the tumor and um, during treatment, we may implement track treatments in free breathing. Uh, and this means that we would shape the beam according to the tumor motion during delivery. And this is actually the idea behind the new technology, uh, which is called the MRLINAC. So this has been implemented in some clinics now all over the world. And these systems basically combines an MR scanner with a linear accelerator. And for the first time, it provides us uh, real-time images uh, during treatment. Uh, so we can image the patient's internal anatomy. And this is, this is an example of uh, some images that uh, we can obtain from the Marlinac. And actually, this is myself and my internal anatomy during free breathing. <laughs> so anyway, uh, coming back to the Marlinac, uh, this is actually a really valuable tool uh, and system because it may allow us to adapt the treatment to the intra and interfraction anatomical changes that I've mentioned before. Um, the, uh, however, not all the problems are solved yet because of the limitation of the MR imaging. So MR imaging cannot acquire data fast enough to provide uh, 3D, uh, 3D high resolution images in real time to monitor the tumor during um, treatment. So during treatment, just to these MR images are available. And this means that we can follow the in-plane motion of the tumor, as shown by these uh, um, movies here, but the motion of the rest of the anatomy remains unknown. And actually, the knowledge uh, of the 3D motion of tumor and organs at risk now is still missing. And however, it may be useful for accurate gated or track treatments, and also is essential for accurate estimation of the delivered dose, uh, including also the motion information. So 
uh, we, uh, to fill this gap, so this missing information of the 3D uh, information, we propose to use surrogate-driven motion models. So these models take um, surrogate signals as input, and, and as output, they can estimate the 3D motion of the internal anatomy. So in the case of an MR LINAC, actually, these surrogate signals can be extracted using the internal anatomy itself uh, from the 2D cinema images, which would be acquired during treatment for tumor monitoring. And in this case, uh, we could have MR-derived signals, input them to the model, and get 3D motion estimates of the tumor and organs at risk during treatment. So to build these models, we proposed to use a motion model framework which was developed by Jamie, my supervisor. This framework combines image registration and model fitting into a single optimization. And this allows us to fit the model directly to the unsorted uh, or separate 2D images which cover the whole 3D area of interest. This framework doesn't assume regular breathing, so we can model breath-to-breath -breath variations, and uh, the model fitting can be iterated with uh, motion-compensated image reconstruction. So now we can have a look at how uh, we build these models uh, in more detail. So uh, during model generations, uh, our framework uh, takes as uh, input, as I said, the unsorted to DMR images, which cover the whole 3D anatomy, and they can be acquired from a multi-slice acquisition. And also the other input are surrogate signals that in our case are MR derived. Uh, as output during model generation, this framework gives us a respiratory motion model where the motion, is the, the motion is described as a function of the signals, and we also obtain a motion compensated super resolution 3D image reconstruction. So now let's have a look a bit more uh, about the input and how we tailor them for the MR LINAC. So, um, the surrogate signals, as I said, are generated from the 2D cinema images. In this case, these are basically from a fixed slice location, and they would be the images acquired during treatment by Anemar Linac, and we call them surrogate images. To generate the signals, what we did was to apply the formable image, regis uh, sorry, the formable image registration to the surrogate images to obtain deformation fields, and then we applied principal component analysis on the deformation field, and we used the first and second principal component on the deformation field as surrogate signals. So now that we know how we get the surrogate signals, we can have a look at the acquisition pattern that we uh, proposed to acquire all the images that we need to build the models uh, and which is tailored for the MR LINAC. So here you can see the slice position of the images uh, over time. And these are the surrogate images from a fixed slice location uh, over time, which we use to generate the surrogate signals. Now, interleaved in time with the surrogate images, we've got the unsorted to the MR images which cover the whole anatomy. And I hope that this, with this animation, uh, this animation helps. So the red frame indicates the surrogate slice location which is fixed, and interleaved in time with the surrogate slice, we've got motion slices in a sagittal orientation, and now we've got uh, interleaved with the surrogate slices, motion slice in axial orientation. In this way, we cover the whole anatomy once, and after, mm, Doing that, we apply a two millimeter offset indicated by these arrows, so two millimeter offset to the motion slices, and then we repeat the whole um, acquisition pattern again, and we do this five times in order to facilitate super resolution reconstruction. So all the images acquired with this pattern is what I will uh, refer to as one repetition of data, and uh, it takes around three to four minutes to acquire those. And I'm mentioning this just because in the next slides you will hear about two, three repetitions, so you know what I mean by that. So uh, now, after all this background, I can uh, uh, show you my current work, uh, actually uh, mentioning a bit uh, about my previous work. So in our previous work, uh, we built the 3D models using the framework that I mentioned to you with the acquisition pattern, and we um, built the models from MR data for voluntary data sets. We started when with using long acquisition time, so 10 repetitions up to 30 minutes, and long processing time to build the models up to six hours. And these times are not really suitable for the patients. However, we 
uh, assess the motion compensated image quality and the fitting error also for fewer repetitions and we saw that actually we could get uh, good results uh, uh, with fewer repetitions down to five, three, one. So this uh, allows us to move on to the patient data sets. So my current work uh, aims at uh, identifying the minimum amount of training data that we need um, in order to build motion models which uh, give uh, us uh, um, accurate model estimates and this will be done for lung cancer patients. Um, in, so basically our collaborators at the Institute of Cancer Research and the Royal Marsden are currently recruiting the patients for our study and so far we've got data from one patient, can, uh, lung cancer patient Canon and Marlinac. We got six repetitions of data, so around 24 minutes and the um, special res resolution of the acquired images was equal to 2 by 2 by 10 millimeters cube. So in order to determine uh, how much I can, we can decrease the computational time and acquisition time, uh, but still get good uh, motion estimates, sorry, what I did was to use the first one, two, three repetitions as training set to build our models. So I ended up with three different models and three different motion compensated super resolution images with isotropic voxels of two by two by two millimeters cube. And then to assess the models, I've used the last three repetitions as a test set. So we can have a look at some of the results here. Uh, these are qualitative results. This is just a sagittal slice from the 3D motion compensated super resolution image that we can get from our framework. And these are the dif three different cases with one, two, or three training repetitions. And hopefully you can see that uh, the diaphragm and the vessels are quite sharp, which means that our models were able to recover the motion quite well. And the image quality is pretty similar. Probably this, in this case we've got a bit uh, uh, more noisy image, but still there is the blurriness that we would have, uh, hopefully you can see it, uh, without motion compensation. And here we've got the same <laughs> diaphragm from here and then the vessels with much more uh, blurriness. So I just want to mention to you that uh, the acquisition time for the three different cases was between 4 to 12 minutes and the model building time was uh, um, um, go from uh, 24 minutes to around 80 minutes and this was without any optimized code. So uh, after that I can show you how I evaluated the models uh, on the test set. So basically for each model we had from the building phase a respiratory motion model and a motion compensated 3D image. And I've usually, I basically use the surrogate signals from the test set and I input those uh, to, the, uh, to our models. And as output um, we obtain the 3D estimated motion in the forms of displacement vector fields at each time point. For, so then we use this displacement vector field to warp, so to deform the motion compensated 3D image and obtain an uh, estimated 3D anatomy at each time point. So the problem now is that evaluation is quite challenging because we don't have the ground truth 3D images um, and we don't have the ground truth 3D motion to compare our model estimates against. However, we, from the test set, we've got the unsorted uh, motion images, uh, which cover the whole anatomy, that we didn't use so far. So basically what we did was to, for each time point, we simulated from the estimated 3D anatomy the 2D image which corresponds to the acquired ones, and then we mm, did this comparison. And before going to this comparison, I just want to show you a qualitative uh, result in terms of the motion estimated by the models. Uh, this is the case of three training repetitions, and here you can see a coronal and a sagittal slice of the 3D uh, image, which it was animated by the estimated motion. And over there, uh, you can see the two signals that we used uh, to drive the models. And from the first surrogate signals, you can see that we've got breath-to-breath -breath variations that uh, our model was able to recover quite well. And um, so you can see that there is like a plausible uh, respiratory motion that was modeled by our uh, models. And here at the top now you can see the comparison just qualitatively um, between the acquired motion images and the simulated motion images uh, at the right. In, in the middle indeed we have the comparison in the form of color overlay where basically the colored pixels indicate intensity differences between acquired and simulated images. And overall you can see that there is a good agreement except probably for very deep breaths 
but uh, obviously I want to say to you that many pixels that are colored here are just due to the intensity differences, but they are not due to disalignment of the structures between the acquired and simulated um, images. So what we, do, we did was to try and quantify this disalignment. So we performed to the image registration between the acquired and the simulated motion images and basically what the image registration gives you is a displacement vector field which tells you how much you need to move one image with respect to the other in order to, for the structures to be aligned and this dis displacement vector field quantifies for us the residual error between the acquired and simulated motion images so here i'm showing you the results in terms of mean and 95th percentile of the residual error in millimeter for along the different um, axes, so superior and inferior, anterior, posterior, and left to right, for the different models built with one, two, or three repetitions. And I just want to remind you that these are values computed over all the test set, which included the three last three repetitions. So here you can see that we've got pretty good results with mean values around one millimeter, so below the voxel size, and values which are actually comparable between the different models. And the same applies to the 95th percentile with values just above three millimeter. So in summary, I'll describe to you our unified motion modeling framework um, that we use to build the 3D motion models from unsorted to the images. And we apply this to a lung cancer patient from uh, Anne Marlinac using a tailored acquisition pattern. I've shown to you that uh, we, could, we can get accurate reconstruction of the anatomy and its motion since we've got mean residual error around one millimeter over 12 minutes uh, period, which is actually comparable with the treatment time. And uh, ongoing and future work will further assess uh, and quantify the image quality of the motion compensated reconstruction and the model accuracy. And obviously we will use uh, much more um, mm, patient data sets from the Marlinac and the aim as I said to you is to determine the minimum amount of training data that we need in order to build models uh, which gives us uh, good motion estimates and uh, finally we will continue to work with our clinical and industrial collaborators so with our uh, with the clinicians the focus will be to try and fit our motion models into the clinical workflow with our industrial collaborators as Jamie mentioned before, uh, we are trying uh, to see if and how we can incorporate our motion modeling framework in something that is potentially suitable for them at Linux. And if I have just 30 seconds, I want to um, just, say, I just want to say that I'm really glad to be part uh, to be involved in this project because this is really a multidisciplinary project with clinicians, MR physicists, engineers, computer scientists, but also with the um, presence of the company. And this is, I think that this is really valuable and essential. And um, we are working towards trying to translate our academic research into something which can make a difference for the patient so I'm really glad. I know that there is still uh, much work to do, but I do think that we are going in the right direction. So with this, I would like to thank all the people involved in this study uh, and also the funders, obviously. And I'm, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm leaving you with my images, so the internal anatomy. Thank you.